All right. Well, welcome everyone. Excuse us for some technical difficulties. Um, we're delighted to have a, another OPC program on Zoom with uh, Chris, author Krithika Verger, who is also a, a former OPC Foundation scholar, and um, OPC Governor Chris Dickey, who's also a longtime foreign correspondent and foreign editor of the Daily Beast and very knowledgeable about Saudi Arabia, will um, have a conversation with her 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open it for questions. And please um, send a chat message if you have a question, and when we open it up, we'll take them one by one. So thank you very much. Go ahead, Chris. Yes, well, I thought I knew something about Saudi Arabia until I was reading Krithika's book. And in fact, it's just a terrific book. It tells you so much uh, about the country and not just about the call, the title of the book, not just about the question of uh, fundraising or funds for Muslim groups all over the world, but also uh, the whole texture of uh, Saudi political environment, Saudi history. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the review I did of uh, Ben Hubbard's book, MBS, for the New York Times a couple of months ago. Uh, but I wish I'd been able to review this at the same time, because we could have said even more about Saudi Arabia that really would have put more depth into the, into the whole picture. Um, I think that, uh, that Patty gave a good introduction of Krithika, a good brief one. Um, I was surprised to see, looking at the back of the book, Krithika, that you not only are a National Geographic explorer, but you are an occasional humorist. I'm not sure where that's going, and I'm not sure I detected that in the book, but I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, to begin a discussion about the book itself and about what you were talking about, I think it's important for people to understand that most of the research, not all of it, but most of it, was done in three different countries that were you chose intentionally because they're not in the Middle East. Uh, one was Indonesia, where I think you were assigned, but you're not assigned there anymore. Are you still in Indonesia? No. No, I'm back in the States. Yeah. Uh, so Indonesia, Kosovo, and Nigeria. Now, they're fascinating choices because none of them are countries that you would instantly think had a lot of Saudi influence, but they do. And the book makes that very, very clear. But the first question I want to ask you, uh, Kritika, <clears throat> is about um, the anachronistic quality of what most of us think when we think about the question of Saudi aid and Saudi influence to Muslims all over the world. I think a lot of us are kind of caught in a time warp 20 years ago maybe even before 9-11 or just after 9-11. And I think one of the things that you make so clear in your book is that a lot has changed since then. And I wonder if you could just sort of sketch how Saudi influence, this is the big question, this is what the book's about, but how Saudi influence has changed in the last few years, particularly under MBS. Um, that's such a good uh, way to put that question forward. And, you know, I think part of the reason our understanding of what Saudi money is or does is dated is because we, a lot of us did learn about the whole phenomenon right in the aftermath of 9-11, where infamously 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi nationals. And then the 9-11 Commission famously had uh, a lot about Saudi terror finance that was previously not very widely known. So it was only in the aftermath of 9-11 and then the so-called war on terror that it began to become almost like a chestnut that there was this thing called Saudi finance that was financing all kinds of uh, groups like Al-Qaeda and so on. Um, but then we kind of moved on, our conversation moved on, other things happened in the news, and we never really thought to update our picture of what this this so-called soft power project was. So, you know, a lot of what we think of as really the active um, 
and high intensity and personal connection based phase of this Saudi soft power project happened before 9-11 and, and came to a close with 9-11. And what happened after 9-11 was that scrutiny on the kingdom's financial outflows and just all of its activities abroad increased quite a lot everywhere in the world. So as we were talking about it, the nature of Saudi soft power completely changed. And the way I learned that was just by talking to people on the ground in the countries that I went to in this book. So in Nigeria, for instance, the, the leader of the Muslim World League, Rabita, um, in Abuja said that funding for his branch of the charity in the most populous country in Africa completely dried up for almost a decade after 9-11. Um, the same thing would you find with Salafi groups in Indonesia and the main conduit of, in, of Saudi funding in Indonesia, which is the world's largest Muslim majority country. This funding really dried up after 9-11. So the question remains, if this active funding decreased a lot, what else was there? So in my book, what I postulate about the Saudi campaign in our century, the 21st century, is that several decades of soft power and investments created a lot of groups such as um, Salafi fundamentalists, also ironically political Islamists who were able to stand on their own feet after 9-11. So a lot of what we're talking about now is these legacy effects of Saudi uh, influence, even though in material terms today, it's quite low. Um, and just one thing I wanted to add is that it, this campaign is sometimes referred to derogatorily as Petro-Islam because for, you know, from 1973 onwards, after the Arab-Israeli war, um, Saudi Arabia's oil revenues were really through the roof. They had billions of dollars to put towards this campaign that really ensured its success in the latter half of the 20th century. Um, oil revenues, as we all know now, are really um, far down. There was a big crash in 2014, and now with COVID-19, there's been an even bigger price war. So, you know, in, in the sense that we think of a lot of these Gulf states as oil rich, what we mean by that in absolute terms has changed quite a lot.